Fire brakes do two primary things for us. They provide the boundaries of our burn unit and they help us stop the fire or at least slow the fire down. And you might think, well, that's kind of not nonsense about ID and identifying the boundaries of the unit, but when we're doing a prescribed burn, we want to know exactly where that fire is going to stop. That's why fire brakes are real important. And then the fire brakes, you need to think of them as a way to slow the fire down or maybe stop a backfire. We rarely have fire brakes big enough that will stop a head fire, a rolling head fire. So we have to use fire to widen our fire brakes so they can stop that head fire and even a lot of times stop that flank fire. So we're going to use fire to widen our fire brakes. There's many different types of fire brakes and most burns that we do have more than one type around them. My favorite types are a ranch road or you know some type of trail through the farmer ranch because it's already there and it's usually you can get equipment up and down it. But we also, another type of fire break I like is bare sole fire brakes that we might make with a tillage equipment or a grader or a dozer or something like that. But you have to realize every fire break has pros and cons. I like a bare sole fire break because it does a good job of stopping the fire. But if it rained yesterday, my equipment's going to get stuck on that bare sole fire break. So everything's got pros and cons, you see. Uh, I also will use green vegetation, maybe a wheat field. Maybe I'll come in here if I'm doing a late winter burn and I'll do some mowing in summer and fall to stimulate the bromes and stuff to create what I call a green fire break. You know, so that we can use green vegetation to help stop. We can use natural topography features like a creek, a river, a pond, a lake. But we can use also things like gullies, canyons and stuff. But you have to realize these topography features are, have pretty serious pros and cons. They, that water feature might stop the, a lot of the backfires and flank fires, but think about how are you going to get to the fire if an ember gets across that thing? You know, and it happens. How are you going to get around that thing to get to that fire in a timely fashion? And that happens occasionally. So you got to have those in consideration too. I mentioned roads. We can use county roads as fire breaks if we pay attention to the wind. You own the smoke on a burn, and really, smoke's a bigger concern than the fire. And somebody's going to talk about smoke today. But if you put smoke on a road and you cause an accident, you're responsible for that accident. So I never put smoke on highways, never, never, on a state or federal highway. I will put smoke on a county road if I have either flagmen to control traffic or if I can use the wind you know, to keep it off those roads or whatever like that. Uh, two other type of fire breaks we'll use, we'll use water and vegetation to wet it down and we'll either mow it ahead of time or we'll wet it down and drive over it and we'll burn right off that wet line. Now that's a very temporary fire break. It lasts seconds, maybe a few minutes at the most. And usually you have to come back and use more water to put it out because it's going to dry out where you wet it and try to put it out. But we, we're going to use a lot of that today because there's very little bare soil around this. So you'll see how we use wet line technique. And the other thing is we may come out and pre-burn a strip around, and that's called black lining. We may use fire to create fire breaks on a day like today when there's very little chance of the fire escaping because humidity is so high. We'll create a black area and then come back and burn off that. But almost all fire breaks that Josh and I and Seth and Harry use is we'll widen the existing fire break with fire before we ever go light that head fire. We're going to use fire to make a more effective fire break. Uh, with the fire breaks, that's probably the most common question we get, and that all depends on your fuel load, the humidity you're burning under, the wind speed, your skill level, the equipment you got. You see there's no one answer there. I've burned off cattle trails. I've burned off quarter mile, quarter mile wide black lines. It depends on what I'm doing with the fire. So you, 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 as you learn more about burning, you'll learn what fire, most of our fire breaks are maybe a, an eight foot wide disc strip and an eight foot wide mode strip. That's the most common type of fire break that I'll use. A lot of times we don't even have the disc strip in there, but I like to have some barrel if I can. But you know, I'm gonna burn differently if I have a narrow fire break. The, the height of the fuel and the volume of fuel out here is going to dictate what I do with a fire break too. If I've got 6,000 pounds of dry fuel and we're, we're going to try to burn at 30, 35% humidity, I'm going to want a little bit more serious fire break. You know, uh, in tree leaves, fire, I should mention in timber, we can go in, and, in through timber and use a blower or a mower or a rake to rake the leaves out of the way and make a fire break through the timber. And this has to be done only a few days before the burn. Because you can imagine leaves are going to blow around if you get some wind after we make that fire break. But, and there's always a lot of hand labor involved with burning through timber because you've got to move logs and fallen limbs and all that kind of stuff. 
So, but we can burn in the timber. Fire breaks are pretty easy to make in the timber. The other thing I want to mention here is coarse fuels as part of our preparation. You know, most of the work in a prescribed burn happens long before we ever light the fire. That's in your writing your burn plan, that's in making your fire breaks, that's in removing your coarse fuels, which we're getting ready to talk about, that's in lining up your labor, getting your equipment ready, contacting your neighbors, contacting authorities. That's where all the real planning and work goes in a burn. The day of the burn is kind of the coup de, coup de gras. It's kind of the wrap up. You know, it's the fun part. The work happens in the preparation. That's really the preparation. Coarse fuels are things that are going to burn for more than a few minutes. Think of like sticks, logs, brush piles. Volta fuels are things that have oils or waxes or terpenes in that make them kind of explosive like cedar trees, uh, blackberry bushes, greenbrier, uh, weeping lovegrass. These all things, they burn a lot hotter and throw embers a lot farther than you would expect for the amount of fuel that's sitting there. So these coarse and volta fuels take some special considerations ahead of the burn. If this was my burn unit where y'all are standing, I'd be concerned about cedar trees that were over six foot tall where you're standing. Because if they light, they could throw embers pretty high and throw a crook. So I'm gonna cut down on cedar trees and drag them up in the burn unit. Usually I'll stuff them under another cedar tree so I kill two with one stone. Or I'll delimb them. I'll take the limbs off the bottom eight foot so the fire can't get into them. You know what I'm saying? Whatever, I, whatever fits my need that day. Uh, Brush piles. A lot of people, when they make a fire break with a dozer, pile that brush pile up right next to the burn. Well, that creates a lot of problems because when you're burning, you want this fine fuel to burn up and go out so you can go on and keep burning. If you got a brush pile that's going to sit here and burn for two days, you got to sit there and babysit it, you know, in logs and stuff like that. So part of that burn prep is you're going to take these coarse fuels and move them well into the burn unit or out of the burn unit. I personally want to burn them up. So I'm gonna move them and scatter them out in the burn unit up there 50, 100 yards away from the edge. But also don't try to avoid piling stuff up because the higher the fuel is, the farther it throws embers. Another thing to watch for along the burn edge is, is dead timber, snags is what we call it. You know, they'll catch fire and they'll act like a Roman candle. They'll burn up through them and throw embers up and they'll carry 80, 100 yards away. So we cut the snags down. You can have a log laying 20 yards away from the burn unit if it's on the ground. If it's piled up any, it needs to be farther in there. Uh, so t those are part of your burn prep is the coarse and volta fuels. Um, anything else about fire breaks that y'all want to add? Seth or Josh or Harry? Okay, do y'all have any questions about fire breaks before we move on to equipment? But anyway, fire breaks have to be planned ahead of time. You know, you can see that. Some fire breaks like timber, we might prepare the week for the burn. Some fire breaks, like a green fire break, which I use on a lot of sloping terrain, I have to plan eight, ten months in advance by the mowing I do. So, you know, that's part of the planning. We mowed ours back in September. Right. Well, one thing I like to do on mow, I'll, I'll mow it in late June, I'll mow it in early September, late August, and then after frost. The reason why is I'm creating, I'm mowing up the spring growth, mowing up the summer growth, mowing up the fall growth, but I'm also creating a seed bed for those winter annuals. And so they need sunlight. So, you know, that's why I'm mowing three times a year to create a, a good, but you have to realize that won't work on a dry, cold winter. Mm -hmm. It won't grow. There won't be anything green there. So there's, a, there's pros and cons to every fire break. You need to realize those pros and cons when you're planning. Fire breaks are not designed to stop the fire. There's very few fire breaks that actually do stop a fire 100% of the time. You know, maybe a huge lake is gonna stop a fire. But all of ours are designed to help us either fight that fire or to light off of. They're there to guide the fire. That's right, that's right. Summer, if I'm planning on using mode lines for a fire break, especially if I'm running cattle in a place, if I put those mode lines in the summer beforehand, those cattle are going to maybe overutilize that area just a little bit, but what it's going to do is going to keep it short. You may not have to mow it again, but also if we go out and mow all that broom sedge down and nothing happens, it's that fuel still sitting there. So if, if you can do it early, the cattle will... Um, the hoof action will put it into the ground and it'll help the, that uh, residual that you left on the ground. Um, this, this burn that we're going to do on the other side, you'll see some gullies and stuff, or just some, some low areas. It, it, if at all possible, we try not to disc those. If, we, if we're using a disc fire, gra fire guard on that side, we try not to disc those areas that are prone to erosion uh, because then we will create a real gully there. 
Um, so we, we, we're sensitive to those type of areas when you are creating fire guards. Don't disc down a steep hill because you're just going to end up with a gully. Yeah, we, in fact, we don't ever disc when the slope's over 5%. We prefer less than 3%. So if it's more than that, we're going to use some other type of fire break besides That's disking. It. My favorite fire break is an already piece of burnt ground. Mm -hmm. Once you get one burn in, you can start throwing more burns into that piece of black. And, uh, you know, it really works well because well, then there's nothing to burn there. Today when we burn, all the duff may not burn on the bottom. And if you come back two weeks from now, it doesn't rain between now and then, then that duff may burn. I've had that happen on a couple of burns. See, so all fire breaks have pros and cons. You just got to realize that and, and learn about what those are.